Good evening, everyone, and welcome to lesson two of Plar English. Um, that should say, <laughs> I'm already making mistakes, look at that, uh, class number six. Um, so this is class number six, and it's our first class where we delve into lesson two. So we had a lot of fun the last uh, five classes going over some parts of speech, some grammar, some usage, and now we're moving into stories and analyzing texts and um, becoming, you know, better readers and better, you know, scholars and all that fun stuff. So let's get started with some very quick announcements. We are in the third week of classes. And once again, I need that to give you a reminder that the last day of class will be November 2nd. So that date's going to come up before you know it. We meet every Tuesday and Wednesday uh, live. So want to get as many of you as we can live every Tuesday and Wednesday from 6 till 7. And don't forget to have your first two lessons in to me by October 17th. So you are eligible for the draw for an iPad. You've got a couple of ways to watch and listen live. You can phone in the studio, tune into the radio, watch on Bell Express View if you have Bell Express View, or you can log in on Zoom, okay? So um, I'm going to email all the students next week and send a, a reminder um, so they have the Zoom link and to try and get some more people on Zoom, and hopefully we get like a live uh, discussion, having some questions, but... If you can't tune in live, that's fine. I get it. People are busy, uh, especially now, back to school, hunting, um, start of the hockey season. For me, next week, I can't, can't wait. So um, if life gets in the way and you can't uh, attend live, you can always watch the lectures um, on my YouTube channel. And I see that my first YouTube video almost has 40 views, um, which is great because I think there's about uh, 56 students who are registered in this class so um, that looks like you know a lot of you are watching that video so that I, I'm really pleased when I see views so I know that people are accessing it and yeah it's exciting I don't, I don't think I'm gonna go viral and have a million views on my videos but uh, I'm really excited when I see that people are watching them you've got numerous ways to submit your work and the but the important thing is is just to start submitting your work uh, start doing it now um, I've had a few students submit uh, like half of lesson one and that's great you don't have to complete the whole lesson you can just send me what you have that's that's fine so just send me what you have or like if you even just do one of the questions and be like you know how am I doing is this what you want I'm fine with that you don't have to complete the whole lesson send me whatever you got just get it out of the way um, You'll always feel good once you get started, right? So um, um, you've got numerous ways you can reach me. I, I have two emails. I check them both. Uh, it doesn't, you can use whatever one you want. Um, you can find me on Messenger, and you can phone me at the office, or I've even got my personal cell. Shoot me a text. Give me a phone call. I'll do my best to get back to you. These are my office hours. This is the time you want to use to get in touch with me. And here's your next steps. This is where I think you should be right now. So, you know, give me a call. Send me an email. Add me as a friend on Facebook. Um, send me a message on Messenger. Let me know you're out there. Let me know you've gotten started. I'm here to help. I want you to make a plan for completing all of the key questions in lesson one. Excuse me, in lesson one. So you should be, at this point, you should be looking at getting lesson one out of the way and done. You should be, you know, building up to writing your information paragraph. And I want you to start reading lesson two. And if you're reading lesson two, you should be answering the support questions 18 through 20. Eight, 18 through 20. That's um, a rough guideline for where I'd like you to be. Some of you might be past that. Some of you may not even have gotten started on lesson one. And that's fine. But I just want to emphasize that it's good to get things started and to do a little bit at a time and don't leave things for the last minute. I speak from experience. I'm definitely um, a student who left things to the last minute, and I wrote a lot of my I wrote, I wrote a lot of my English papers 
while I was under the gun and had like, you know, an hour before, you know, the deadline and just cramming as many words as I could. Um, um, you know, um, so I, I've, I've been there. Um, so you want to get a head start and not leave things to the last minute. And that's why it's important to reach out to your DEC, to reach out to me, to reach out to anybody in your life and just kind of get some help. You, you got to ask for help when, when you need it. So, Okay, so here we go. We're going to jump right in to our lesson for today. So we are on lesson two. We've, we've wrapped up lesson one for now. If you have questions about lesson one, feel free to ask them. But our live sessions are going to be moving right along. We have five lessons and we have a, about five and a half, five and a half weeks left. So we got to, um, we, we have to get through all the material. So, but if you have any questions about lesson one, feel free to ask me. But we are moving on to lesson two. So here's some learning goals. So if, if you look at the course material, every lesson has a series of learning goals. Now these are your learning goals as a student. So you will learn strategies for reading literary text. So um, a literary text is, you know, a short story, a poem, um, a play, or let's say a novel, right? That's what we call literary text, right? So um, usually things that are made up, imaginary, as opposed to information text, like we looked at last lesson, like um, textbooks and instruction manuals. So it's a different kind of reading. So it's the same words, it's the same grammatical rules, it's the same punctuation, but you have to approach it differently. And that's what today's class is going to be all about. You will, I will read and respond to literary text. So, uh, you know, being an English student, um, you know, like uh, a student of the English language, but English in the sense that you're studying uh, texts, like short stories, poems, plays, that kind of thing, you read them and then you respond to them, right? So you, you read them, it makes you think, and then you add your opinion, right? Um, you will learn strategies for reading news articles and you will read and respond to news articles, right? So this is a really important component of learning English, right? It's not, um, you don't just read things, you read them and you respond and that, and then that response um, helps you understand what you just read. That's the way the human brain works, right? It's sometimes, it's, it's hard for us to understand concepts unless we respond to them, unless we have a conversation about them, or we, um, we, we write our own poetry. Um, sometimes you watch a movie or a TV show, and like it's really confusing, and then, then like you didn't quite understand what happened. And then you talk to your friend who watched it, and they're like, oh, you didn't get that because it's really about this. And it's like, oh, okay, I didn't see that. So... Um, that that's how you learn. You you kind of you read something and then you respond to it. So today's word of the day um, is going to be story, and that's what today's lesson is all about. Now, I wanted to just spend a little bit of time talking about that word story. I think it's you know it's one of the best words in the English language, and it's one of the fundamental parts of being a human being. It's what we call a universal. Um, I guess like a behavior or y you can't go anywhere in the world and find a people who don't tell stories. Um, human beings are storytellers. Doesn't matter if you go to Finland or Newfoundland or the heart of Africa, Australia, Northern Ontario. If you, if you go anywhere in the world, you will find storytellers. That's what we do. Um, we like to tell stories. Stories help us make sense of the world. And stories aren't just, um, they're not just words, right? Um, stories can be 100% visual or, you know, um, you know, pictures, right? So um, 
we, we've got like a, a birch bark scroll here, right? So that that tells a story. Um, I've got a um, a medieval manuscript right here that you know um, was written by a monk uh, hundreds of years ago, right? I've got an ancient um, an ancient Japanese scroll right here, right? So that has a combination of images and words, right? So the way we tell stories is through words, through pictures. We tell story through sound. So, you know, we, t we tell stories in through dance, like you name it. Like we, we tell stories in so many ways. Um, and then if we just look at written stories, um, there's so many ways you can tell a story through written words, right? So you, as a reader, you have to approach each one in a, in a different way. And that just comes with experience and comes with time. So, so today's word of the day is story. But if we're if we're if we're translating that English word into um, Anishinaabewin or Ojibwe, we have "diba diba jamoin," right? Which is uh, a noun, which translates to a story or a narrative. In English, it's a story. Again, it's a noun. Now, story has many definitions, right? Um, so, but typically it's a narrative. Um, this is a really important point. Stories can be true or fictitious. They can be real or they can be made up. Um, um, and then that, you know, so a story is... It, it, the word story covers pretty much everything from, you know, from, from fables to myths to legends to a funny story you heard to, you know, it, it covers a huge range of, uh, of, you know, ways we can, we can express things, right? So it, it's a pretty, it's a pretty diverse word, right? Um, and then you can even use the story to talk about a story, right? So it, it, it gets, there's, there's many layers to it, right? So, uh, and I thought, you know, um, today we're talking about words and we're talking about stories. And if you go through lesson one, they talk about using a skill, um, a skill or a technique. It's kind of the same thing that you do as a reader and it's called inference or when you infer something. So infer, that's a verb, right? I can I, I do it, I infer it. So when you infer or you make an inference, you have a limited set of information or you don't know the whole story, but you're making a guess. And you're not making a wild guess or an uneducated guess. You're making a guess that's um y you've got a little bit of a you've got a few pieces of the puzzle. But you, you're missing a big piece, right? But you got a few pieces over here, and you're trying to put it together. Um, so let's take these two words, for example, right? Um, the first one is um, Zaga Nash Imoen, which translates to the English language. And the second one is, is Wemete Goje Moen. And you notice that, you know, all, all of these three words have that moen on the end of them and remember the the last part of the word that's called a suffix right so the suffix is like the the last part of the word so moen is a suffix right so if this word anishinaabe moen means um you know the language of the ojibwe people or the language of the ojibwe and this word means the english language and the, the bottom one means the French language, I can make an inference that the word Moen, it must literally translate to language. Um, I'm not sure. I, I looked it up. I couldn't find it. But it must mean language or words or something like that, right? That's the meaning of that word. It's got to be, um, you know, it's got to be something in that range, right? So, and then, so the suffix is that. And then the the prefix is the is the front part of the word, um, like this right here. This would be a prefix. Pre means before, right? Um, 
That's another prefix right here. So that's a prefix. This is a prefix. So the front part of the word tells me um, who speaks that language, right? So even if I don't speak the language, um, a as I learn more of it, I can start to recognize the patterns. And so I don't know how to speak Anishinaabemowin, but I'm trying to learn a bit of it. And as I do that, I'm trying to pick up patterns. And I'm, and I'm getting better at making inferences as I do that. I have a long way to go, and it's really challenging. And, and I sometimes think I'll never learn it because there's way too many words, and it's just too complicated. But I'm trying to keep an open mind, and it's definitely a goal of mine that I'd love to learn to speak the language. So as, you, as we learn English, it's kind of the same way, right? So as you learn English and as you become um, a master of English, in a sense, right? So like you, even if you're fluent in English, you can always take it to the next level. And that's what we're doing here with Plar English. We're taking our English to the next level. So we have to learn things like the parts of speech, which we don't have to go through. But uh, you know me by now. If you've heard my previous lectures, I think you really have to know these parts of speech. Now, I want to just have a, a brief discussion. I love history, and I love um, anthropology and archaeology. Um, I think maybe it goes back to me watching Indiana Jones a lot as a kid. Um, I was born in 1981, so like uh, movies like The Temple of Doom were like some of my favorite things of all time. I still love that movie. Um, so I'm trying to bring a little bit of the knowledge that I that I've I've learned along the way. So I'm reading a book right now, and it's called um, it's called the history history of History of the World in 100 Objects. Really cool book. I try to read one chapter a day before I go to bed. And this hand axe is in that book, okay? And so this hand axe, um, so, you know, like if you were to, you know, if you were to, if you were to hold on to this thing, you know, that'd be your thumb. Let's see how good my drawing ability is, right? And, you know, that would be, you know, that would be, you know, that's kind of how big this thing would be, right? You'd, you'd hold that in your hand. Now, this hand axe was made in Africa um, a very long time ago, like hundreds of thousands of years ago. And they, the archaeologists and the anthropologists who study uh, ancient humans think that this tool, um, it looks deceptively easy. Like you think y you could make this thing, you know, in a couple hours just by jamming two rocks together. But apparently the, the skill and the precision to make something like this would have actually taken like almost like weeks or months or years to figure out. It's really hard to do. And somebody would have to teach you how to do it. And, and there's actually students who study this kind of stuff and they make these hand axes. They go out and they actually sit there with rocks and they try to make one of these hand axes. But... Uh, what they discovered was was that they couldn't make them unless they talked to each other. Um, you couldn't just sit next to your buddy and watch him do it. Um, he could show you, but there's there's certain stages in in the process that are way too complicated, and that's where human language comes in. That's where like a story comes in, right? Um, we we wanted to explain things to each other, and we wanted to. Um, pass knowledge on to our kids. And so way before we ever invented writing or letters, we had language and we spoke to each other and we sh taught each other how to do things. And this hand axe is like evidence of like, you know, the power of language because they found these things all over the world, right? Um, so people taught other people how to make them and the technology spread. Um, but that technology can't spread unless you have language and people talking to each other. So that's the power of a story. That's the power of language. So here's our headline. Here's today's headline. So this, again, is ripped from the pages of today's headline. This one is another one from the Globe and Mail. 
I really like the Globe and Mail. I've mentioned this before. I I spend a lot of time on Facebook and I spend a lot of time on YouTube and um and and that's fine and and but I just find that like I I I waste a lot of time and I can spend an hour on Facebook and not learn anything but you know like I I keep in touch with my aunts and my uncles and my cousins and my brother and my buddies from high school and I read lots of cool stuff but Sometimes I like to just force myself to read a news app at the Globe and Mail, and then I learn cool stuff like this. So this is a this is a real article. This came out a couple of days ago. So the headline reads: Indigenous objects repatriated from small British museum come home to Haida Gwaii. The objects arrived on Haida Gwaii in late August from Britain. Among them, a heavy, intricate, argillite carving of a ceremonial feast platter depicting a rockfish and orcas and inlaid with bone, likely made in the 19th century. So today we're talking about stories and inference and trying to figure out words that maybe you've never heard before. Or like maybe it's a word you've seen in print or you've heard it before, but you don't really know what it means. Um... So here's one that I read, uh, repatriated, right? Um, I, I've heard that word before, and you know, I, I don't, I didn't really know what it meant, but just from the context of this thing, um, so you've got these indigenous artifacts, and they're going from a museum, and they're going back to Haida Gwaii, where they came from, right? So you know that the word repatriated means to to send back or to return. But like all words in the English language, or any language for that matter, they have multiple layers of meaning. So I know that repatriate means to return, but um, th there's probably a deeper meaning, and we're, and we're going to come to that. Um, here's a word I, I had never heard before, uh, argolite. And my pen's too thick. This word right here, argolite, I had never heard that word before. Um, but when I read that headline, or sorry, when I read the, uh, the first sentence of the article, I know that argillite, um, it's heavy. You can make carvings out of it. Um, you can make a platter out of it. Um, the word argillite, like it, it, it just sounds like a mineral or like a metal or like an element. So um, I'm making some guesses. So like what, what does that word mean? And the other word um, I'd heard before, but didn't really know what it means, is this one, rockfish, right? So I thought like a rockfish is like a, um, a specific kind of fish. Maybe that's from the Pacific Ocean. I don't know. But I'd never heard of that before, so I, I had to guess. Um, so that's the, the article from, from today's headlines and a little more on that. So... This is the headline, um, nouns in blue, verbs in red, prepositions in, sorry, verbs in green, prepositions in red, adjectives are in orange, and uh, adverbs are in purple. So... I love doing this. It, I think it really helps to recap these things. Indigenous objects, that's a noun phrase. We treat that as one noun. Um, so, and, and indigenous objects is a plural noun. So, always good to be technical. It's a plural noun phrase, right? Um, and so that's the subject of our sentence, right? So again, sometimes the subject of a sentence can be a person um but sometimes the subject can be an uh, can be a thing in this case it's a thing so indigenous objects and then they were repatriated there's that word again that's our verb from so remember from is always a, uh, uh sorry from is a preposition and prepositions are relationship words so they are repatriated from a small british museum so it's a british museum that's a that's a noun phrase. Um, it's it's a small museum, so the word small modifies that noun phrase. Um, they come home to Haida Gwaii, right? So 
Haida Gwaii is a place. We take those two words, and that's one noun phrase. So they, they've come home to, to Haida Gwaii. Now, this one's a little tricky. So home. Now, the word home could be a noun, right? It could be a, a place you go. Like, I am, I am going home, right? And then home is, uh, is, a, is, a, is a noun. But in this case, when we say they come home to Haida Gwaii, this adverb is actually modifying the verb come, right? So they, they come home, right? So a um, little bit tricky, but that's, that's how that works, right? So sometimes a word can be a noun, it can be a verb. Some words can be nouns, verbs, um, adverbs, depending on how they're used. So it's all about context. It's all about the words that come before it and after it. Here's, the, here's that first paragraph in the, in the article. The objects arrived in Haida Gwaii in late August from Britain. Among them, a heavy, intricate, argillite carving of a ceremonial feast platter depicting a rockfish and orcas and inlaid with bone likely made in the 19th century. Now, these are what the platters look like. They're, they're absolutely stunning. These are beautiful. Um, this one right here is probably um, the one that they're talking about in the article, right? Um, you've, got, you've got a fish right here. I'm not sure if that's a rockfish. Um, this, to me, looks like the inlay, the bone, right? But that's, that's what these platters look like. They're absolutely beautiful. It's, they're amazing to look at. Um, so there, there's the words, right? So the word repatriate, it means to bring back to his or her country of land of citizenship. So it's a verb that usually means when a person, not an object, but I guess you could use it as an object, but the dictionary definition says that it's when somebody goes back to the land they came from. So let's say someone from the Philippines uh, immigrates to Canada. And then in their old age, they go back to the Philippines. They would repatriate back to their home country. Intricate means having many interrelated parts or facets. Argolite is any compact sedimentary rock composed mainly of clay materials. Clay stone is an argolite. So a rockfish is any fishes found about rocks. So a bass, like, uh, like around here. Uh, Northern Ontario, a small mouth bass. That's a that's a rockfish. And inlaid is when you set into the surface of something, right? So the bone, the bone that that's inlaid bone, right? It's bone that has been laid into the clay. So there we go. That's so we're we're learning um, we're learning um, some some words along the way, okay? And then now we're going to start talking about stories, okay? So I want to get through, I'm trying to get us through three stories, okay? So I'm going to I'm gonna read this uh, a little bit uh, quickly, but not too quickly. We can't understand it. And I want to give this story the, the, the respect it deserves. So this is why a rabbit has long ears and long feet, as told by Josie, uh, Kaminawash. Um, and this, I found this online. This, this is actually online. So um, maybe I'll, I'll post a link for it. But you know, um, if, if you Google that, it'll come up, right? So the community of Mishka Gogamang, they collected a bunch of legends from their community, and then people um, they wrote them, and it's it's like a it's a free word document on their website. So um, so here we go. It's the same thing again with Nanabush. He was really hungry again when he woke up, and he decided to go out for a walk and look for food. He came upon a stream and thought, oh, I can catch some fish here. He tried to look into the stream to see if he could catch any fish with his bare hands. Oh, I'm not going to be able to catch any fish here, he thought, because the water was really deep, and it was very hot. Fish go deep when it's hot. He came upon some berries. He wanted to see if he could eat those berries because he was really hungry. Just before he started picking them, he found they were very dry because it was hot, so he left them alone. He came upon a tree with a beehive in it. He thought it was so quiet in there, so he said, I'll take some honey. He made a hole in there and looked inside and found everyone was sleeping in there. But one bee woke up and saw this eye looking at him, and then everybody woke up and started chasing him. 
He got away from them, but he was still hungry. What am I going to do now? I'm so hungry. I'm getting weak. How am I going to get some food? Suddenly, a thought came to his mind. I shall call all my brothers. So he called the owl, the fox, the bear, goose, skunk, mouse, everybody. And they came wondering what he wanted. They didn't trust him either because they knew him as a trickster. And he said, the reason why I'm calling you is because I will teach you to sing a new song. But you have to sit in a circle. He sat on a boulder with all his brothers sitting around him in a circle, and he got ready to teach them a song. The last one that came was a rabbit, and there was only room for him to sit beside Nanabush. Before I teach you this song, you have to have your back towards me. You're not supposed to see me, he said. They want to learn the song, so they do this. Nanabush starts singing, and they started listening, trying to pick up a note here and there. The owl, very curious, moved his head this way and that because he wanted to see what was going on. They were not supposed to look, but he's so curious, he can't help it. So he moved his head around, trying to see what was going on, and he finally turned his head right around and saw Nanabush just about to grab the rabbit. It's a trap, he hollered, hollered the owl. All the animals ran away, but Nanabush managed to catch the rabbit who was sitting by him. A long time ago, rabbits had short feet and short ears, just like a little puppy. This particular rabbit wanted to get away, and it wriggled around desperately. Nandabush had had him by the feet, and then he also grabbed him by the ears. The more the rabbit wiggled, the more Nandabush hung on. Finally, when the rabbit managed to get away, he had long ears and long feet. Now, I chose this story because in your course material, you have one of Aesop's fables, and those are ancient Greek stories. And I've often thought it was really cool how similar uh, Aesop's fables are to um, uh, the Nanabish stories and a lot of stories um, um, that are recorded from indigenous people from, you know, from, from forested areas um, like in northern Ontario. Right? They're, they're very similar stories, right? They... Um, they teach you a lesson, they explain how something got a certain way, so uh, a lot of African cultures have very similar stories, right? There's lots of, um, in the African tradition, there's a Nancy the spider, and the spider is the trickster, and the spider is really small, and the spider has to, like, use his intelligence to trick lions and big powerful animals, so it's a, it's a very similar, um, very similar kind of way of telling stories, so when we when we talk about stories um a lot of stories follow a certain pattern and these are what we call um th this is the um this is called the 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 story pyramid um this guy freytag is the guy that's uh known for for drawing it out this way but you know a lot of stories will follow this this example so in that story you just heard um there's there's a bit of what we call exposition that's the background information. So that's, um, in this case, it's just Nanabush is walking around the forest and he's hungry and he wants to fish, but he can't find any fish and he wants some berries, but they're all dried up. Um, so that's your backstory. He's, uh, he's hungry. Um, and then the initial incident, I would say that would be, you know, him gathering, him gathering all the animals together. The rising action would be, you know, him him telling the story and then I would say the climax of the story would be you know the owl kind of uh, shouting out it's a trap and then Nanabush grabbing the rabbit and and of course when he stretches out the ears and then the falling action would be you know that happening you know like the the, the ears being stretched and the this is a French word this is the, the denouement or the, the concluding action. The tying up of the loose ends would be the narrator coming out and saying, you know, and that's why rabbits have long ears and long tails. So that story we just heard more or less follows that pattern. And so we're talking about stories and, um, and you know, short stories to be specific. And these are the elements, right? So these are the... Um, we're talking about the elements of a short story.
So these are the elements of a short story. So a story has a plot. And a plot is what happens in a story. It's um, this happens, then this happens, and then that happened, right? Uh, it, it's pretty hard to tell a story and not have a plot, right? So um, things happen, and sometimes the plot of a story can be, like, really um, jumbled up and confusing. Like, if you watch um, some TV shows and some movies, they start you right in the middle of the action, and then they go back. Um, I think Breaking Bad is a really good example of that. If you've ever watched the TV show Breaking Bad, um, the very like first minute of the TV show is like in, in intense, confusing action. You don't know what's going on. All you know is that something wild and crazy is happening. And then they bring you back to the start. And then it kind of builds you back up. So, so some stories, it's like this happens, then this happens, and then that happens. But... There's always a plot, and the plot is made up of things like a conflict, um, exposition. Exposition is the background information, so it, it usually tells you um, how the characters got to where they are, or it just tells you just more about who they are. There's the rising action. You know, things are building, things are building, and then there's finally a climax. There's usually, like, you know, like every action movie follows this arc, right? There's always, you know, we find out who the bad guy is, right? And we find out who the hero is. And then we find out more about the bad guy. And we find out more about the hero. And then there's rising action. You know, uh, the stakes get higher. Um, and then there's a climax, a big battle at the end. And then once the battle is over, there's like a couple of scenes at the end. And then the movie ends, right? So most action movies follow that formula and most stories do as well the characters obviously this is the people animals or things who are involved in the plot of the story right so the character is is the who of the story um sometimes people sometimes animals sometimes aliens um sometimes even things you know uh if you get creative as, as a storyteller it might even be like objects who are the the plot of the story When I was a little boy, I used to like watching the little toaster, the, the, the adventure. It was like a toaster that went on an adventure. <laughs> that seems so ridiculous to say that, but I loved that movie when I was a kid. But it was like a bunch of appliances and they go on an adventure, right? So it could be people, animals, or things. Uh, the setting is where and when, right? So usually when you think of setting, the first thing you think of is, is where it happens. But where it happens and, and when it happens are, if not, they're equally as important, right? So... And depending on the story, sometimes you know where, but you don't know when. Or sometimes you know kind of when the story is taking place, but you're not sure where. And these can be real places, or these can be imaginary places. And every, every story has a conflict, right? Um, every good story, anyway, right? There, there has to be some kind of conflict where somebody wants something and they can't get it. Um, something is standing in their way. Um, you know, if, if a story doesn't have conflict, it's pretty boring and it's, it's, it's not that exciting. Right. So most, you know, good stories, there's, there's some kind of conflict in there. Now, the, these next two are, are the hardest ones to pin down, but the theme of a story is the central message or the idea of the story. And the reader usually, excuse me, has to figure this out on their own. The author or the narrator doesn't usually come out and say, hey, this is the theme of the story. Um, the theme of the story only comes to you if you think about it. You, it like it's, um, you know, it, it's, so the plot is what happens. And the theme is kind of like, what's it about? You know, like on a deeper level. Point of view. So this is really important. So the perspective from which a story is told or narrated. So a story only exists if someone is there to tell it, right? So um, first person, first person is I, uh, third person is he or she, right? Um, he did this, she did that, or I did that, right? So um, a first person narrative is very personal because um, it's, it's from one person's point of view 
I did this. These are my ideas. These are my thoughts. You know, an autobiography is written in the first person, whereas a biography uh, is a book written about someone. That's going to be written in the third person. Um, so it's about someone, not from their perspective. So there's, there's different types of conflict in stories. So you've got individuals versus themselves. You've got individual um, versus individual. Um, so, you know, try, trying to think of some examples here, um, you know, from books. You've got, um, uh, I was trying to think of the Tom Hanks movie when he's, um, uh, when, when he's stuck alone on that island and, and, he's, and he's all by himself, right? Uh, you know, so an individual versus themselves, that's when the person has like an inner conflict and they're sort of battling, um, they're, they're battling themselves, right? So, like, they're, they are their own worst enemy. Um, individual versus individual. This is probably the most common kind of conflict. It's somebody versus somebody else, right? Um, it, it's two people battling it out. It's, uh, you know, it, it's, it's one person versus another person, right? Individual versus nature. So, this could be um, uh, Into the Wild, that's a great, a great movie, a great book. It's about a, a boy, a young man who goes out to Alaska and he tries to rough it in the woods. He ends up dying. It's, it's him versus nature and nature wins. Um, the individual versus society. Um, I would say like maybe the Hunger Games could, would fit in that, in that mode, right? Um, um, individual versus a supernatural power, right? So, you know, um, or individual versus, you know, technology, you know, something like the matrix would, would, would fit that, m that model of a movie, right? Individual versus a supernatural pattern. That would be, you know, like a, you know, like a vampire movie, something like that, right? So that's, that's that kind of conflict. Now, I'm just going to move ahead a little bit here because I want to get into it. But, um, you know, the, the plot of why the rabbit has long ears and long feet uh, would basically be, um, it, it's a pretty simple plot. Um, Nanabush is hungry. He can't find food. He gathers the animals together because he's hungry and he wants to eat one of them. He tricks them all. And they all catch on to his trick except the rabbit doesn't. And that's the plot. The characters are Nanabush and all of the animals, particularly the owl and the rabbit. The setting is somewhere in the forest. We don't really know where. It's not really pinned down to a specific location, but it's some kind of a forest setting. The conflict would be, um, you know, the, the conflict, it, I think, is that he's hungry and he, and he, wants, to, and he wants to get something to eat. Um, the point of view is third person. It's, it's a narrator talking about Nanabush. It's not from his point of view. It's, it's a third-person point of view. And the theme would be, um, I, I think it's about to teach you about, you know, being hungry um, and, uh, you know, like if, if you're hungry in the summertime, what do you have to do, right, to, to get food, right? You got to be, you got to be creative, right? But, um, now, what's the difference between the plot, the theme, and the moral of a story? So the plot is simply what happens in the story. Nothing more, nothing less. What happens? The theme is what it's about on a deeper level, okay? So plot is kind of what a story is about, but it's, it's more like what happens, and a theme is what the story is about on a deeper level, right? Um, and the moral of the story is the lesson you should learn uh, when the story's over. Not all short stories have a moral or like um, a lesson to be learned. Sometimes they're just cool stories, right? I mean, like, so not every story is going to have a moral and not every story is trying to teach you some amazing lesson. Like, some stories are just funny. And, like, as human beings, we like stories that are scary we like stories that make us laugh. We like stories that make us cry. Uh, we like stories that make us think. Um, so some stories make you think, and some stories just make you laugh. And some stories just give you information. So, But, you know, 
So the moral would be like, you know, like the, it'd be the point of the story, right? It's, it's, it's more specific than the theme. All right, so in, in your course package, you've got a short story by um, a man named Richard Van Camp. Um, and I want to give you a couple of clues um, and give some context to this story. So I love reading stories, and I love breaking them down. And, and this is what I realized after I read this story. So it's a short, but I think it's pretty complex. This is, this is a very complicated story. Um, and if you look at it, there's actually several small stories within it. And some of these might be considered anecdotes. An anecdote is a funny story. You might tell somebody around a campfire or, you know, um, just sitting around trying to get a laugh, right? Uh, a fable, a parable, legends, you know, like these are like small stories meant to teach a lesson. The narrator of the story seems to be someone who loves to collect stories and tell them. And I thought this was the really most important part was he tells us that we shouldn't tell secrets. Uh, we should keep a lot of our secrets to ourselves, but he's actually telling us many secrets. So there's kind of like this um, conflict going on because he's like, don't tell secrets and keep things to yourself. But here he is telling us a story. And it's a story that got published in a book that, you know, thousands of people read. So it's kind of interesting, right? Um, and then within this story, you've got about at least four other stories. You've got the one about the man and the chipmunk. You've got the one about digging someone up and finding a pearl. You've got the one about Freddy and Stella. This is the longest one and arguably the most important one. Uh, and there's the one about the Krees scaring a bear with a spear point. So, um, and this is the actual text of the story. So, um, okay, so sometimes... Sometimes a first-person story it is written um, with the with the with the word I. Sometimes it's me. Okay. So uh, where is it? Um, right here. He told me. Right. So now this story is written by Richard Van Camp, but we don't know if he's actually the narrator of the story. Right. So. Um, he could be inventing a narrator. This could be him, but this is a this is a first person story, um, and that's and so this is the first story. So the the tone of this story is, is very uh, conversational. So it's like you just sat down next to someone, and he's going to tell you a story, right? So he keeps kind of going back between these two kind of tones, right? Like it's. It's very conversational. It, it seems like it's an oral story, um, and it's like it's like you're sitting next to a storyteller, and when he tells one story, that story reminds him of something else, right? So, this this is a, a short story in itself. Everything on this page, but it's not, but it, it's part of a bigger story. Um, and then you've got. Um, the second part of the story where he tells that really fascinating thing, you know, if someone, um, if someone, you know, doesn't fool around or, you know, like I'm thinking like someone who stays celibate, never has sex, that like, like a priest, um, if they dig them up, they find a pearl. I've never heard that before, but that's, you know, it's a pretty wild story. But um, there's another story within the story. Uh, this is some this is some dialogue. This is some great dialogue between Freddie and Stella, right? So, um, so this story comes in there, right? Um, and, and you get this exchange between Freddie and Stella, and um, you know, I I think most of you probably understand what Stella is asking for. She keeps saying, "Come over and help me out," but doesn't say what she needs help with. And uh, Freddie takes him a little time to catch on, but by the end of the sto by the end of that paragraph, he's caught on and knows that, you know, why she wants him to come over. Um, and the at the end of that exchange, uh, Freddie does not go over to Stella's house, but he knows that she's into him, 
and that really excites him and you know and that's when he changed right he's not waiting for his wife who's so his wife has left him and his son and this guy Freddie had decided that he's um he, he's over her now and he's going to um he's going to move on but you don't you don't find out what happens to Freddie and Stella you know so did they ever get together that's a secret we just have to mind our own beeswax on that one so um the narrator of the story is what we call like an unreliable unreliable narrator and he and, and he and he's kind of like a trickster right because um it's almost kind of mean in a way to like tell somebody a story but then not tell them how it ends right and he's just like he you know here's a here's a really cool story but no like you're not going to get the ending of it, right? So you just have to mind your own business on that one, right? So and then he goes back to the spirit of the story, the medicine, the medicine of secrets, which you know I I think might be a clue to what the um, what the theme of the story is about, what the uh, what the what the real meaning is, right? So and here's another one. So he he keeps jumping between. Here's a story about this, and then. We're, we're done with Freddie and Stella, and then we're hearing about uh, these Cree people who are sneaking up on bears and tapping them on the bum and then making the bear run away, which is just hilarious to like just to visualize that and to, and to think how like uh, like how much courage that would take and you know like would that actually work and like um, would the bear just not turn around and eat you? But um, so he tells that story, um, and then and then you would do that and. Imagine if you did that. Imagine if you if you poked a bear with a spear and then the bear ran away and then you weren't allowed to tell anybody. Like that's that would be like one of the hardest things you could do to 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 resist the urge to not tell people. So um so I, I think that's that's the repeating kind of uh you know like what's what's the similarity between Freddie and Stella? what's similar between that and the man playing the flute for the for the porcupine in the forest right it's about like it's like when you share the secret you you, you ruin it right so um and you know and then then he then he kind of has this great thing at the end right so um you know um the the only secrets i have are my pin numbers and the love songs that i sing into the wind for someone i haven't even met yet but I know I will meet one day, right? So um, every five years, I spill the beans to somebody about something. Um, I wonder if that every five years or so is a reference to the fact that he is a writer, um, and then maybe every five years he puts a book out or like a collection of short stories. So it'd be interesting to see um, how often this guy publishes his books, right? So, you know, that's... And then... And then if we think about the power of secrets and we say like the plot, so again, the plot of this one's kind of complicated, right? It's, um, you know, what happens in this story? Well, a lot of things happen, right? But I would say the plot, you know, I, I would say the plot would be a narrator. A narrator tells us, you know, tells us many, many stories or, you know, secrets, if you will, right? There's a lot of characters in the story. I would say the narrator is the most important, right? He's the main character. The setting, there's not really a setting, um, but um, there's the forest, there's uh, Freddy's house, you know, but there's not really a traditional setting. Um, the conflict in the story would be, you know, like telling secrets and uh, like telling a bunch of stories. So... The conflict here, it, it's a little bit, it's a little bit tricky. It's kind of like a puzzle to figure out. Now, what's the theme of the story? So, like, these are going to be the hardest to figure out, conflict and theme. The point of view, it's, it's a, it's a third, sorry, it's a, uh, it's a first person narrative. That part's easy. But I want you to think about theme and conflict, because that, that's, that's, that's part of your, um, your key questions is the, is the conflict and the theme of the story what are they you know what what is the true conflict here what's the um you know what's the struggle um I is it individual versus nature is it individual versus individual is it individual versus themselves 
Is it individual versus society? Um, and then the theme of the story, right? Um, and then, you know, like when we did the, the idea web um, to generate ideas, this could work for the theme too. So like when I, when I try to think of a theme of a story, I'm just going to think a story. I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to write down words like stories, um, secrets, um, storytelling, um, uh, you know, oral, you know, versus written stories, um, you know, hearing a story and then writing it down. Uh, I, I think that's a, a kind of a key component of, of what that story is about. So I think it, it's about, you know, it's like, you know, it's like being a writer. There, there's a great line in that story where, you know, people, when they know you're a writer, um, they may not want to tell you their secrets because you might use them in a short story, right? So, um, you know, it's being a writer, it's, it's, it's fighting the urge to tell everybody everything. Um, I'm kind of thinking about like social media and just people sharing all the details of their lives and, you know, what do we keep secret? What do we hold with, what do we, what do we not tell each other? You know, what kind of things are sacred? And what kind of things do we do we sell to make money? So you know, it's like, you know, selling out, you know, selling stories versus just telling them. So I, I think it's a lot of those things are happening in this story. It's a very complex story. Um, I had one more story tonight, but we don't have time. We're we're out of time, so we will catch up on this uh, next week. So read those stories, give it some thought, and respond to it. And thanks for listening. We'll see you next week.